Right. Hello, everybody. Um, it's probably good to start with a prayer. So let's do that. Uh, Lord, I pray that uh, as we come together today to hear your word, that um, it would be you speaking through me, that you would be revealing yourself to, um, to us all, and that we would be able to come and have a deeper relationship with you um, and a deeper understanding of you uh, and what you call of us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, so... Last time uh, I spoke, I spoke on the parable of the sower in Matthew 13. And because I'm going to be doing the latter half of Matthew 13, it's probably good to just do a brief recap. So, and the main point of my last talking was um, that our job is to proclaim God's word. And if there are people who do not listen, then that's okay. That's not our job. So our recap starts with Jesus on a boat in the middle of a lake talking to people in parables, talking about seed and the different soil that it can land onto. The disciples ask Jesus why he's talking to the people in parables and he responds with this. To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. And a little bit further down in his response he says, this is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled. Going into Isaiah 6, where this prophecy came from, showed us that Isaiah willingly put up his hand to be a messenger for God. And what was his message that he was supposed to deliver? Well, it was a message to the people of Judah. Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull, their ears heavy, and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, turn and be healed. The reason this message was so interesting is because God knew he was going to send Isaiah to a people who were going to be unresponsive to this to people who weren't going to listen. And similarly for us, people that we share the gospel to may react unresponsively. But it's a solid reminder that we are to proclaim God's word, but it's God's business what happens in that person's heart. And so now this leads on to verse 24 of Matthew 13, where I'll be picking up again and just continuing on. So, verse 24 to 30, uh, we're straight away, we're thrown into another parable told by Jesus to the audience of the crowd. This one being on what the kingdom of heaven can be compared to via weeds that are sown into a landowner's field of wheat. There's some brief dialogue between this landowner and his servant on what to do and how this happened. The servant questioning whether the master had plant, uh, what the master had planted, if it had been good seed, and the master explaining that it had been an enemy that had sown bad seed into it. Because we get Jesus' input into the interpretation of this parable slightly further down, I don't want to go into it quite yet, but there is something that I want to quickly add that is, to the crowd, this is probably some vaguely familiar account of revenge through agricultural sabotage. Um, and Roman law during the time specifically dealt with this scenario. So it's not uncommon to them for this sort of story. So we'll come back to that parable when it comes back up again. Um, but for now, we go into the parable of the mustard seed and of the leaven. One of the key things to note that is that all of these parables start with the kingdom of heaven is like. These are supposed to be little hints or, or tastes of what the kingdom of God will look like for us now. A little, little spoiler, Easter egg. The mustard seed parable shows us a man planting a small and tiny mustard seed. Now, Jesus' word is that it's the smallest seed known to man, pretty much. And try not to get caught up in whether it is or not. It's... Instead, focus on the size of this tiny seed 
that eventually turns into this giant tree that birds can nest in. Before going into breaking down the parable, it's important to reflect on the parable teller. You see, Jesus has already informed the disciples that they have been given access to the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. These parables seem to show that God's kingdom is, in fact, also present in a way in Jesus' ministry. The Messiah, in Jewish law, was a big deal. He was this saviour that was going to be a strong warrior and overthrow the suppressing nations, overthrow Rome. He wasn't supposed to be just some guy wandering about Galilee with a group of followers, a group of disciples, and healing some sick people. Just like Jesus, this very small, inconspicuous seed became mighty. But more than that, the gospel started with Jesus and a handful of followers that were with him. He had no real earthly rank. He had no real exorbitant lifestyle. And for the most part, didn't catch the world's eye at all. What seemed inconsequential at first, like the mustard seed, grew into a worldwide movement. Moving on to the parable of the leaven, once again, this is supposed to show us what the kingdom of heaven looks like. So what's the importance hiding of hiding leaven into flour? Well, similarly to the seed that grows, so does the leaven. When it's inside a dough, it spreads its way all through the dough, like it's been spread all through the world. The same way that the seed would be hidden in the ground, when the leaven is hidden in the dough, it grows. And I think the fact that it uses the word hidden in some translation reinforces the idea of the hidden revelation of the kingdom, which was growing right in front of the crowds Jesus was talking to. In verses 34 and 35, we get a small break from the parables and move into prophecy. It reads this. All these things Jesus said to the crowds in parables... Indeed, he said nothing to them without parable. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. And it feels like it echoes what happened in verse 10, where the disciples are asking, why are you talking to the people in parables? This prophecy is taken um, from one of the Psalms. Whether it's written by Isaiah or not, it's probably irrelevant. But I think this sudden break into prophecy here is Matthew's way of reminding us that just like how God's plan has been there all along, slowly working and coming to fruition, although looking hidden, that Jesus is part of that very plan, fulfilling hints that were given long ago. So now we can return to our parable of the weeds. Once again, we have the disciples unsure of what a parable means. So they ask for an explanation and Jesus gives one. The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world and the good seed is the son of the kingdom. The weeds are the son of the evil one and the enemy who sowed it is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. Jesus' explanation shows us God's patience and love for us. God tolerates the wickedness of humanity in the present so that there will be those who will receive him, so that those that will receive him will have time to become a follower. Despite our sin, God is patient with us. 
not wanting us to turn away. How incredibly loving is that? So, though all of these pas- so through all of these passages, there have been two things that have stuck out to me. Firstly, is patience. Not just God's patience for us, but that we need to be patient for the future. All of these things, they're they're hints for what's to come, but we have to be patient. Everything's going to God's plan. Everything's part of it. God's in control. We may want to see the kingdom now, but God lovingly gave us some hints of the kingdom, and we'll just have to be patient for the rest. And secondly, the hiddenness of everything. The hiddenness of the seed in the ground, the hiddenness of leaven or yeast in the dough, the hiddenness of what seed is what. Despite everything seeming hidden, it's God's bigger picture and God's big plan, hidden since the very foundation of the world. And although we may not be able to have the full picture, and although we may be impatient wanting God to act now and stop the hiddenness of his plan, The truth is that he sort of already has. He did that at the cross. And the parables are there to remind us all to be patient and of God's love. So as Jesus said at the end of 43, he who has ears, let him hear. So will you hear what he has told you? At the cross, that even though you were sinful, and even though we are undeserving of the love that he shows us, he saved us anyway. And that we don't need to know more than that until the time's right. I'll close in prayer. Lord, thank you for your revelation to us. Thank you for this deep, deep love that you've given to us. Thank you that you don't give us more than we need to know, but you give us enough to show you who you are to us, that we can trust you and that you would continue to give us patience and just guide us throughout our lives, wanting to follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.